There's nothing to be afraid of. Yeah, right. What am I smoking? Remember that song? I don't know if millennials know this song. It goes, don't worry, be happy. No millennials? No, it's only the uh, non-millennials shaking head. <laughs> Don't worry, be happy. Brian said no, okay. But it's, a, it's kind of a trivial little song you might hear on the radio. It's like, don't worry about anything, just be happy. What alternative universe are you living in? Now, some of the stuff we worry about, and we've talked about life and death in the last few minutes here of really hard situations. I mean, it's impossible not to worry. But life has enough things that are thrown at us that sometimes we worry about stuff that we don't need to worry about. I had my first traumatic moment on an uh, international flight, and I thought it was the end of the world over nothing. It was coming back from Germany with my family. This was in the late 90s. And uh, we hit what is normal coming in across the Atlantic Ocean. And by the way, normal flying into Denver. You ever had any turbulence flying into Denver? Have you ever breathed? You know, that's like a silly question. Flying into Denver is like going to an amusement park. And, but, but here's what we experienced. It was called an air pocket. Anybody heard of that? <clears throat> or it's also known as a microburst. And it's caused by intensely decelerating headwinds, which can be faster than 60 miles per hour, that literally create this pocket. And remember, the, the airliner is flying how far, how high? About 35,000 feet, particularly across the ocean. So there's a lot of room to maneuver. So the airline, or the airplane, excuse me, is built with that in mind, aeronomically. And uh, and yet, if you don't know about air pockets and microbursts, the, it's, they're capable of actually dropping as far as 2,000 feet. Now, if it goes that far down, what will come out? Oxygen mess. Very good. You're tracking well. And then, of course, Panic City, because nobody ever listens to those presentations in the front. <laughs> Could you repeat that? You see? And uh, now, there's two times that microbursts can be a problem. I want you to help me here. What's the one thing that could go wrong while the flight's going on? No, no, not really. Here, Brian's got it. There you go, future seminarian. Um, <laughs> stuff flying around. That can, it can hit somebody in the head. But when else could a microburst be a real problem? There you go. See, Stephen knows. Because Why? He doesn't have room to correct. When you're at 35,000 feet and you drop less than 1,000 feet and I'm screaming, you know, oh, I'm going to die. I knew it would come to this. And there's, oh, by my first microburst, there's all kind of ladies screaming. That's not sexist. There were ladies screaming. I'm just, just journaling, journaling what happened. And all right, some men might have screamed too. It's okay. Um, <laughs> but you see, there's a whole lot of room to maneuver, and there's nobody in the flight crew that's worrying about stuff. They're not. The, the, the pilot's not getting around and say, well, he just says, well, we're encountering, we're encountering some, incur, some turbulence here. Everything's all right. Please sit down. Stop your, if you don't have your seatbelt strap, da, 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 da. There's nothing to worry about. So here's the key. Try and understand in life what are the legitimate things to worry and what we really need to bring to the Lord. But the thing that Jesus said more than anything else, you would have thought he would have said, well, I love you guys, I love you guys, I love you guys. He Actually, his life lived out showed us that. His sacrificial death was an expression of incredible love. But what did he say to us over and over again? Do not be afraid. Over and over and over and over again, he says, don't be afraid. Because it's hard to be a mortal human being in a world of turbulence. By the way, the Bible pictures as we move towards the end of history and the second coming, that God says, I will shake all things. How's that for a microburst? And when things start to shake, I get nervous. So we're going to learn about the great reliability of God as he says, don't be afraid. Let's stand for the word of God. This is just four or five little verses. Four, five, six, seven, four. That's why my fingers don't count. All right. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, 
and after that have nothing more than they can do. But I will, I will warn you about whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Ouch. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. The word of the Lord. All right, please be seated. Three principles this morning. Um, the first is going to be an exclamation of how God works in mysterious ways. And by the way, I can only explain as much as the word of God gives me. I can't speculate the angels will be laughing at me. The second is this hard verse about fear him who has the power to send you to hell. And then the third is the glory of the gospel. So if you're going to leave before the third principle, okay, make sure I have your cell phone number because I was told this by a seminary professor that if you ever let them leave without understanding the gospel, you must get on the phone and you must call everyone in the church and finish the sermon. So I bet you won't leave now, huh? huh? I don't want him calling me. Here's the principles. Powers limited by God, the leash we're going to talk about. Reverence given to God. What does it mean to fear God? And then deep significance from God. Knowing his love and who we are and being his. And it's all in this little section. All right. Powers limited by God, 12.4. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more they, that they can do. Only Jesus would say something that counterintuitive. That's outrageous. I mean, just do a, do a poll, do a survey. How many of you are fearful of some terrorist that wants to kill you? You know, or some, uh, should we pick on Russian mafia? I don't know. They don't have your best interest, and they want to wipe you out. I'm afraid, I'm afraid. They've got all the power. They could wipe out my life. And if I lose my life, I what? I lose everything. There's nothing left. My mortal body, it's dead. Everything is over. What are you talking about, Jesus? Well, he is really being counterintuitive against the grain. And, and we're going to break that down here in a second. But I, I want to talk about the principle of God's leash. This is unique to Doug Pong. You won't find it in Calvin. Or Luther. Maybe you will, but I don't know. God has everything in history on a leash that he controls. <clears throat> Excuse me. Every molecule, every event, every terrible ruler, and it causes us to ask a billion questions because it seems like God is using evil and letting it touch him, and it's not. But he is absolutely in charge of everything that happens without having to be evil. How's that for starting your day with a lot of thoughts? But here's what it says. Now, the best way I can start you to understand that, has anybody here ever read the book of Job? Be honest. Okay, it'll help. It's an amazing glimpse behind the curtain as to what's happening in the spiritual world between God and Satan, the demons, and our lives. And in the book of Job, which is quite a masterpiece, God and Satan are talking. And they're talking about this upright man of God named Job, who has a really cool family, and everything was going really great. He had what Tim Keller calls a designer life. You know, it's all working out with my kids, my wife, money, the business, it's what we want. It's what we want. And so Satan challenges God and says what? Well, you know, you take away all this stuff, the nice car, the extra money, the extra vacations, the kids doing great, which puffs us up with pride, and I bet you he won't love you as much. And so, okay, we don't know all that is said, but we do know that there's a bit of a challenge there. And so God, under his sovereign leadership and control, allows Satan to carry out some nasty stuff in Job's life. 
And it's very intense. It's the whole issue of theodicy. Why is there evil in the world? And what's God doing about it? And in the process, which ends in a glorious way, by the way, we see all kind of religious people giving advice to Job and saying, well, you're not going to church enough. If you'd only go on Wednesday night more or Tuesday night with the young adult group, these things wouldn't be happening. And, and all that kind of these religious theories are coming about. And, and yet God is letting us know in this little glimpse, I'm in control of this. Now, that's not easy to understand, is it? And by the way, there's a word for it. It's the capital of Rhode Island, you trivia buffs, and begins with a P. What is that? Good job. You've learned your capitals. Yeah. And it's not a, a state capital, but it is the way God governs history. And by the way, I want you to know, this is a side note real quick. It's for free, by the way. There's a difference between providence and fatalism. The Muslims believe in fatalism, or even New Agers. That's the way the universe works. You're in the wrong place at the wrong time. It was meant to be. Well, don't, don't even cry, because don't even bother with it. Providence, by the way, allows tears and anguish and legitimate fear. But providence means that God is using all the events of your life and everyone's life to bring his purposes and sovereign will to bear. And he's working through very tough stuff. And he is in control. Now, our secular friends don't believe that. You don't know how many people I talk to, and I know you do too, that say, you know what, I'm just, I've had it with God right now. I've trusted God, and I, I'm done with that narrative. I don't think you can fully trust God if there is a God. But we take it even further here. And by the way, you notice he calls you friends here in verse 4. He's not saying, take another hill for me, work hard for me, work hard. Some churches, you feel like you're just pushing a boulder up a hill. God, I need to take the beaches again. And he has brought us into his deepest affection. And he calls us friends. But what does it mean? Let me back to that. It means that God has given limited power to the worst people in the world for a particular time and for a particular purpose that we won't fully understand. And he has them on a what? Short lease. Do you see that? Nebuchadnezzar, Old Testament. Crazy, goony, goony king that God, of course, revealed a whole lot to. But there's this sense in which God has allowed this short leash, and he's got Satan on a short leash too, who's causing all kind of upheaval and chaos in the world. Do you see that? And that leash is in his mighty right hand. And I have a, a friend who's a pastor who does a lot of counseling of people that are with all kinds of addiction stuff and she was an addict too and she's just an amazing woman of God and I was joking with her about this principle. I said, you know what? Her name is Betsy. I said, um, I said, God really keeps me on a short leash, which is true by the way because I, I, the old hymn goes, I'm prone to wander, oh Lord, I fear it. Yikes. He says, get over here. Get over here. Come on, focus. And she said to me, God keeps me in a chokehold. And as a former addict, she meant he doesn't let me go on. Your leash gives you way too much room to get into a mess. And so we had a great debate about that. It was really fun. But the point is, we understood that God's restraining hand is upon us. I tell you, my friends, don't fear those who kill the body. It's just an army tent. After that, what are they going to do? You imagine that? What are we going to do now? We can't hurt him anymore. All you've done is taken this shell we live in for what, 70 years, 80, 90, if you're a jogger? <laughs> and you've tossed it away. It's going to get tossed away anyway. And the second principle would say, but the one you want to fear is the one who can deal with the real you, the eternal God. Now, I'm going to go back here. The millennials are going to have to catch up here. When I was growing up, there was a writer named Francis Schaeffer. Brian has not heard of him, but um, he was very instrumental. Yes, he has. I'm just teasing. And he was very instrumental in teaching me to think. And you've heard of Francis Schaeffer. Thank you. And the God who is there 
He is there and he's not silent. When I was Brian's age, all these, these writings were forming how I think theologically. And uh, his wife, a magnificent woman named Edith Schaefer, had an illustration she used all the time. And by the way, the biography of Francis and Edith Schaefer is called Tapestry. And uh, she gave a picture of the weaving of a rug, which my mother liked to do. And she, but she got this one rug that had all these intricate weavings. It was one of the most beautiful rugs. I'm not one who fawns over rugs. Some people get really misty-eyed over them. A rug's a rug, wipe your feet. But this was a, had all the colors on it. But here's Edith's point. She said, if you turn over a work of tapestry, you will find what? Thank you, Randall. Knots, and kind of yarn. This is woven. It doesn't make sense. It's just all over the place. It's, it's really nothing to look at, right? And she said, that's our life. All the messes, all the disappointments, all the sins, all the times we didn't trust God, all the roadblocks we ran through that he tried to stop us, and the mistakes, the wrong decisions we made, da-da-da-da. It's all these knots. It's all these knots. I said this morning, it looked like my surgery from the last time, but that's way too intimate. But that's what it reminds you of, yuck. And then you turn it over, and what do you have? You have a beautiful rug. The colors woven together. And Edith Schaefer, I'll never forget that illustration. She said, that's a picture of God's providence, of how he weaves together all the disappointments of life and so that he works it for good. So Jesus is saying, look, you're going to be afraid. And remember, please remember the context of this. He's heading towards Jerusalem. The crowds had been huge in Galilee. They were all on, I want to be healed I want to have free meals. I want to have water and the wine. I want to have, you know, the feeding of the 5,000. Look at his food. This guy is great. Who wouldn't want to pursue such a Messiah? But now as he heads towards Jerusalem, as the crowds thin out, he says, look, guys, you're going to be afraid. And by the way, it, it bore itself out. The, the history of the Christian church has been one of what? Persecution. And of course, up until 313, the Edict of Milan. I mean, in the Roman Empire, you know, we were lunch. The lions say, hippie, dude, this is better than McDonald's. This is Christians. And so he was getting them ready for the incredible challenges to come. So he says, don't fear those that can only kill the body. What is, what's that? You're going to die anyway. And as we'll see in a second, fear those who can send you into hell. You know, one of the first century, not chants, it was one of the great cries about, about martyrdom. And some took it too far. They almost wanted to be martyred. Martyrdom is a gift of God, by the way, just like any other gift. You don't choose to be martyred. When someone is martyred, it's one of the highest honors in serving Christ. But Christians used to say, go ahead, death. Go ahead, death, the deeper you bury me, the higher he'll raise me. Go ahead, throw my body into the deepest sea. The deeper you bury me, the higher he'll raise me. And then one of my missionary heroes, Elizabeth Elliot, she's with the Lord now. Boy, did she suffer. She lost uh, two husbands and then wound up with Alzheimer's one of the godliest women I've ever been around. She taught at gordon Conwell Seminary when I was there. And uh, her husband was the, the well-known missionary, Jim Elliott, who in 19, is it 56 or 58, maybe? 58, so you know the missionary people, you trust them. Um, went to Ecuador to minister to a very barbaric pagan tribe, to live among them like God does among us, called the Aka Indians. They befriended them. They went in to meet with them. They thought they had an open door. And uh, was it four that were killed? Five, see. All right. Five of them were speared by the Aka. By the way, as the story goes, Elizabeth went back to live among them as a single woman with young children. And uh, the Aka's came to Christ. But here's what she said. It's almost immortal words right now. I mean, Seriously. It was one of her great sayings then, but it stayed with me. 
She's, she was, of course, admonished by people. What are you guys doing, you crazy missionary zealots? You have families. You have young wives. What kind of men would take their young wives and young children to these situations that are so dangerous, which turned out to be true? All five of them were speared. And here's what she said. No one is foolish. No one is foolish who gives up what he cannot keep a life on earth to gain what he cannot lose. Let me do it again. No one is foolish who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Eternal life, the promise of Christ. All right, that's the first principle. That's a lot, I know. I know that's a lot. But the point is powers are limited by God. You're hearing the word providence and tapestry and how God works. And, and it's a mystery. You never go up to somebody who's been hit by a drunk driver in a random situation and say, well, it's all part of God's plan. No, you cry. You realize that life is agonizing and you love on people. It's not some vague theory, but it undergirds how we understand God working in history. Second principle. Reverence given to God. And I'll try to be brief on this because the, the clock has hit the magic number. But I warn you whom to fear. This is hard. Fear him who after he is killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Now, what does that mean? Um, since the garden and the, the fall, man has run from God in sin covered themselves in shame. So do we just need to back off from God when things are tough in our lives? What does it mean? Many people that are not even sure there is a God are afraid of that God and they spend their whole life running from him. It means this. Let me just tell you about Isaiah real quick. In Isaiah 6, there's a vision of the Holy of Holies which, by the way, we can access because of Jesus Christ. And the seraphim, the cherubim, the angels are there, and they're, they're worshiping God. It's, and it's, a, it's a picture of his holiness. And Isaiah, the prophet, who was a really good guy, I wish I had his language skills and his smarts. When he captured the glimpse of the Holy of Holies, what did he say? Boy, this will be great on Instagram. <laughs> Whew. The amount of followers I'm going to get on Twitter. No, he said, Woe is me, for I am undone. That means I'm coming apart psychologically, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. And then, of course, the Lord atones for his sin through the angels who take the thongs from the altar. altar and he touched his mouth, his filth. And he is protected by God. But when we fear God, it simply means learning how to revere him and love him. And that that reverence is a deep understanding of the most important theological principle you will ever learn. And that is, he is God and we're not. Not everybody's able to go to Denver Seminary and learn all this heavy stuff. But if you learn that principle, as you battle with life and battle with God, he is God and you're not, you will have a sense of trust and peace and all right, I'll let it go, I'll let it go, I'll let it go, I'll let it go. But to fear God also means to apply your mind to wisdom. It literally means to learn from God and recognize he's not just a chum. I told you about the illustrations when I was growing up. But no, it was when I was pastoring in Michigan. This one guy, would, I love the guy too, but he's talked about, yep, let Jesus fly in your plane with you. Let him be your consultant. Let him help you with your business. I'm thinking, that's great. Whatever I want, he'll help me make. That is the nonsense of evangelicalism. Jesus is flying the plane. You're along for the ride. And fearing God means... Yes, he is holy. But I want to add one thing to it, and this is so cool. I don't want you to forget this. We fear God from within the covenant. Okay, that sounds heavy, but I'll break it down. God is married to us. 
Everything we do is part of the covenant signs. Baptism, the Lord's Supper, is the ring. The whole marriage thing is all about his covenant. He has made us his own. Inside the covenant, the Passover lamb has been slain for us. There is incredible love and acceptance and assurance and patience. And there is a covering for all of our weaknesses. And there is the holiness of God is granted to us in the midst of it because we're part of his family. You see, we really are. We're in the covenant. If you go outside of the covenant, you get what? The wrath of God against sin. And then you run from God like you've never run. But you'll never escape. I know that's hard. I know that's hard. But this is the principle when he says, and Jesus is just laying it out for us here. He's saying, I warn you to whom to fear him who after he is killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. And by the way, have a good day. Oh. And so what does it mean? Real brief. It means that I take his word much more seriously than I do your word. And you do the same with me, okay? I give it more weight. I was talking to somebody this week again about God's glory and how we glorify God. We glorify God through living for him. Got that. But when we see his glory, what does that mean? Well, for most of us, we don't see it in a way that we will in heaven right now. It is absolute beauty. It is light. It is the most extraordinary character you will ever witness. But here's what I think is much more practical. The Hebrew word for glory is kabod. You don't need to know that to get into heaven. It just showed that one time I went to seminary. Um, but kabod means weight or matter. It's literally the word for matter or heaviness about it. And so when I take God or I glorify God, what do I say? Your word matters more than my problems. Your word is much bigger than my fears. Your assurance is way more important than my bad emotional moments. And when I get criticized from other people, you matter to me, God, much more than the criticism I'm getting from other people. And because you are glorious, you have weight, I'm really going to listen to you now. And not just vague obedience. I am really going to listen because you matter. I love that song that Tina had us singing this morning. And I don't remember the exact lyrics, but I was absolutely loving it. And you, know, you, you are more real to me than the air I breathe. And that's another way of saying he's glorious. And I mean, those words were just incredible. You matter more to me than my own breath. Nothing can matter more than that, especially to me as an asthmatic. Don't mess with my breath, but you are more real to me. And that's how I glorify you. Amen? I want to make sure you're awake in hearing that because I got to bounce ahead. And to glorify God... And to revere him means you trust him even when nothing makes sense. And most of our friends are going to say, I'm not trusting him. This makes no sense. Most of life will make no sense. Most of life you will not be in control. I'm sorry. You want to be in control, so do I. Most of life will not make sense. But he says, you will trust me because I matter to you more than anything else. All right, let's, get, let's finish up because your stomach might be calling. But you've got to hear the gospel before you leave. I won't let you leave. The doors will be locked. Let me out of here. I know, I know. Wait, this is against the fire code. Deep significance from God. Now, I, I want you to see the transition here, especially those of you that are new to the Bible. I mean, he just smacked us in the face with verse 5. Fear those, fear him who's able to throw you into hell. Thank you, and you have a good day. But now he says, I love you. And you're in the covenant. You're mine. Look at the transition. He says, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Even you bald people. No, that's not in there. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. Now, what's the, what's the major point made about sparrows here? I don't know if anybody buys sparrows, do they? No, they're cheapy, cheap. Oh, okay, do the math here. They're how much? I don't know about inflation. 
You could Google that. How much are sparrows worth today versus Jesus' time? I don't know. Even Google would have trouble with that. <laughs> I know. Sparrows are what? Five for two pennies. With inflation, that might be, I don't know. But he is saying that God so cares about these little birds. And he takes absolute pride from God's perspective in the intricacy of their design. But they're not the ones for whom he died. They're not his cherished children. They're part of creation. In the sense, they're just incidental. But God's handiwork is like so expressed in a little sparrow. Imagine what he is thinking about you. Isn't that beautiful? <clears throat> now, theologian and resident Steve Hill said after the first service, he came in and he gave, he gave me a lot of attaboys. It was great and stuff. He said, but you forgot to mention that the sparrows were used as the cheapest form of sacrifice that you could get for the temple. I said, okay, thank you. I'll quote you next service. And, uh, but that, that's not the point he's making here. They were cheap. for the, the Many people who wanted to offer sacrifices but didn't have the money, you couldn't get any cheaper than a sparrow. So Jesus is using an extreme example here to say that, God cares for the sparrows. What about you? He also says about what else in another section? About the what of the field? The flowers are the lilies. I love that. Which cause allergies. <laughs> he says, how much more will the Lord care for you? He says, you matter. Do you remember I told you about the meaning of glory? Wait. What does it mean that God's glory is in us? Well, one day it'll mean you're just looking like incredible glory, light and wise, but right now we matter to God. And, and I said earlier, I'm going to say it again. What matters to God right now? What's the right theological answer? Say it again. What did she say? That, that's true, but what, what is God's heart view that he thinks about all the time? We prayed at the first service after the pastoral prayer. Thy Thy kingdom. It's his kingdom. Okay. I mean, that's God's about his kingdom. He's about the nations. He's not messing around. It's, it's, it's absolutely what he cherishes. And so he taught, Jesus taught us to pray by saying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth that is in heaven. And then so what does that mean? It means every ethnic tribe. That means missions. It means every people group of the world will be brought in because he says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. But then let's not make it too heavy and theological. What is the kingdom made up of? People, thank you so much. And I want you to see the quick contrast and then we'll go home. God has already done with his creation. Now, we get weird. Is he going to create any more planets? I don't think so, but I don't know. He didn't reveal that. Will we find new planets? Probably. He's an amazing creator. And after he created, he said what? It is good or that's cool, whatever you want to. He said, it's amazing. High five. And he said it within the Trinity. Whoa. But he's not worried about the creation. He's not really upset about planet Neptune. He says, go explore Mars, but Mars is Mars. I made it. What is he concerned with right now? You. Nothing's more important than his people. You say, how do you know that? Good question. Because he gave everything through his son for you. And your significance comes from not where you're working or how pretty you are, how much you weigh or don't weigh, or who you're married to or who you're not married to, or how many friends you have, or how healthy you are, how many miles you can run without feeling tired. Your significance comes from the fact that God has you and knows you and owns you. And he goes to the extreme here to let you know what that looks like. He says, even the hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not, you are more valuable than the sparrows. And so the bald person says, doesn't he love me? He said, you still got hair. As I said this morning, hair is everywhere. It's in your nose. Women are constantly shaving it from their legs. It's everywhere. Bald people have hair. And why would he even say something this absurd? See, I still have all my hair. It is like Somebody showed me a picture from 1993, how dark it was. I said, that's what ministry does to people. <laughs> it was darker than Brian's hair 
when I came. And he has the darkest hair in Aurora. Okay. <laughs> but he says, look, that's how much I value you. That I would use something that silly, something that trivial to say that you are mine. You are mine. And I love you so much. David Crowder has a song that I love. It's old now, but it's about his tender love for us, covenant love. We might have even sung it, but I sing it quietly sometimes. I never sing loud for a good reason. He is jealous for me. And love's like a hurricane, I am a tree, bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I'm unaware of these afflictions, eclipsed by glory. Oh, Crowder. And I realize just how beautiful you are, God. And how great your affections are for me. You may have heard the chorus, oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves you and me. And I know he hit some bad notes there, but I don't care. I know the Lord just wants to hear me praise him. Your significance comes from Christ. Not how cool your family looks. Or not from the fact that you don't have a family. Your significance comes from Jesus. And we get so emotionally crippled over stuff that doesn't matter. God, you matter. Your kingdom matters. I'm worried about stuff that doesn't mean a hill of beans. And when I start to sing with this band... And I say, Lord, I praise you and I see your glory. I say, yeah, one day we're going to see it face to face. What a future I have. But I also mean you matter more than my problems this week. You matter more than my loneliness. You matter more than my brokenness. You matter more than my bad self-image. You matter because you are everything. And you love me. When Jesus talked to Martha in the Gospel of Luke, Martha was upset with Mary because Mary wanted to sit and listen to Jesus, and Martha was a type A like us who had work to do. And uh, Martha was very, very annoyed that Mary wouldn't do more. She just wanted to sit around and listen to Jesus. And then Jesus said, by the way, he called her name twice. Watch out when he does that to you, like Simon, Simon. He said, Martha, Martha, you are worried about so many things. That's us, isn't it? But only one thing is important. He said, Mary has chosen what is important, to focus and love Christ. And he said, that will never be taken away from her. Let's pray. Jesus, we are worried about so much stuff and life just kicks us and knocks us down. And we're worried about cancer. We're worried about death. We're worried about a lot of things. We're worried about life without our loved ones. We're worried about loneliness. Uh, we're worried about finances. But you've told us how much you love us and that in Christ, in the covenant, in your family, that we are so important to you that you are absolutely focused on us. So much so that you number our hairs. And that seems, Father, that seems absurd to us. But you show us the magnitude of your love. And again, if there's anyone here listening on the internet or not here, or here this morning, said, I want to know Jesus. I don't know all this stuff. I need Jesus. I want him. And he's calling me right now. I sense it. I want to know him, give my life to him. And I pray this prayer, Lord Jesus, you've come for me. You've died for me. You've taken my place and all my filth. And you've come to me with the love of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I say, Lord Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life, to live in me. <clears throat> I give you my sins, past, present, and future, and I receive from you your perfect, completed righteousness. And I commit to living for you. If you prayed that prayer, you've crossed from death to life, and you've become a Christ follower, a Christian, or as Luther said, a little Christ.
please let me know. Let Brian know. Let someone know. And Father, for those of us who name the name of Jesus, we, are, we want this year to be a, a year of growth. And those little things that are eating us alive, we give them to you and we'll give them to you tomorrow morning and the next day and the next day and the next day. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand for our final song.